Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I think that's probably the reason why I'm here. And I just want to say, you know, thank you for having me back on. Like, I think every time we spoke, we've always had such a meaningful conversation. And I know it's good banter. It is chat shit. You're right. It is about chatting shit. But, you know, every time we've come on, I feel like the, the conversation just growing more and more. And like you just said there, I pride myself on being a critical thinker. I pride myself on understanding research and I also pride myself on dispelling any misinformation in this industry because there is so much bullshit out there and it's difficult for people to kind of weigh through all the detail isn't it and I think what you're doing with this podcast is absolutely phenomenal like I've seen the growth over the past year and watched you guys develop more with this podcast and you know with the, just the, obviously the two of you now but it it's just been such it's been like you know you sit there like a like a proud brother on the sideline. Yeah. It's kind of what it's like, though. You yeah. sit there with I know like what a, you proud, mean, yeah. a proud colleague and a proud brother looking, going, do you know what? That's an incredible change. And I give you a phrase. It's called, the word's called mudita. And it's seeing joy in, there's no other, we have these words in the English language, such as joy. I'm Googling it now. Mudita, M-U-D-I-T-A. But it's seeing, it's being joyful and being passionate and caring about other people's, other people's achievements and projects that they like like that's that is the word and that's a word i use so often with my clients is that i that's what i champion the phrase mudita in the sense that watching people like you guys just being genuinely so happy and joyful that people make such an incredible change not just in their way of thinking not just in what they're doing in this industry but you're both full-time professional men you're you both have families you both have other roles and responsibilities yet you stick on this for free for anybody else that wants to just have a knowledge base or come in and just have some fun and listen to conversations because i think these conversations can be so dark and sciencey with some people but you don't yeah. do that and it is like i do genuinely think the podcast is brilliant mate and you've i'm, I'm an avid listener i love the content um i, I love some of the guys you've spoken to the coaches before the the incredible athletes like it really is mm. it's a good podcast and you've worked you've got a great little a great little thing going forward so i'm a yeah. fan so please don't stop doing it because it's good to a part of the job like, do you know what part of the job is mudita it is the mudita. whole of the job you get mudita. to yeah it's all mudita like it you make these impacts on your clients lives for the benefit of, uh, you know of their health their performance, their mental health, you know, it's its fantastic. You do get to take pride in seeing your clients succeed. So, yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, I'm with you on that mindset, Dean, 100%. And that's the new word I'm going to put to that, you mood eater. Know. It's showing that vulnerability mood as well, isn't it? I like you know, it. Because it's male. And like I say, it's cockney as well. But yeah, mood eater. Apples and pears. <laughs> mood eater. <laughs> It does. It does sound. I'm, uh, it does sound like I'm down my local boozer on a curry night, going like, yeah, yeah, yeah lambuna and a mudita. Yeah, that's it. That's but yeah, it. I'm still going to use exactly that word. What it sounds like. I feel like you could use you could use it in so many different sentences, couldn't you, mudita? Because it just sounds yeah, it's crazy. Really, it's time really about the pub That's what I do. Of yeah, it's just it means it means quite a bit to me. So I kind of use it in yeah. a lot of my awesome. phrases and stuff. It's really it, it's a powerful word. What about you, Tom? What, what are you thinking? Um, I'm going to get to the point that this actually goes beyond 10. I'm happy to go back to the old scale. I am going down to the cemetery <laughs> oh, with my God. shovel. I'm digging Jimmy up. I am bringing him over to this individual's house and I'm laying his corpse on top of the missionary style. You know? And I'm using Jimmy like a puppet. We can make fun of the That's dead. The best dead I've ever heard and I'm life. bouncing Jimmy up and down on top of them going, sure, dear, oh, dear, whatever he used to fucking say. Yeah. Jim will fix it. Jim will fix yeah. it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. oh, don't worry about putting your barbells people, away. People... Jim will fucking fix it. But yeah, I mean, um, this is awful because I do work oh, in a commercial right. gym. Um, it's it's absolutely <laughs> unforgivable because at the end of the day, for one person leaving a dumbbell on the floor or leaving the barbell in the rack with, you know, just six, it's, it's a 60 kilo barbell, not a big deal. Until you realise you're in a commercial gym, yeah. we have the elderly... The disabled, about the frail, oh, people that just God, ain't sure yeah. enough in general. And the thing is, now at the end of the day, when I work in a commercial gym, sometimes I'm the only person on shift. I might be taking a class, a workshop, I might be with someone else. So I might not be able to help that person because I've, I'm only one person with one pair of hands. I can't be everywhere at once. And it's just shitty. Join the, it's a 24-7 yeah. gym, 24-hour. 
if it's unstaffed and someone needs help getting his plates off, you know, it's fucking horrendous and it's shit. And I know... If we go forward then, so what, what, just to tell people out there who aren't aware, what part of the military were you in? Because you're in a different part now, but what part were you in initially? So I started my career in the Queen's Royal Azars, which is a regiment I'll always hold dear to me. Um, I'm still in close comms with them. Mm. We have groups. I've, I own a Facebook group for all of them. I kind of work around mm. with with bringing out about mental health and helping with physical activities and stuff. So I still keep a really close tie with the Queen's Royal Azars. Um, and I'm now in the Royal Army Physical Training Corps. So let's, uh, let's, talk um, about that. let's talk about that transition. Because how long were you with the Royal, yeah. Royal Azars for? Was that quite a long time? Or? So I was with the QRH for... Eight, so I, I was with the QRH for... My God, nine years, eight, nine right, years okay. nearly. Um, and in that time, I, I become a PTI really early on okay, in my career, awesome. really early on. So I've been a PTI for like eight, nine years before I transferred into the PT Corps in 2016. So I put you in a good so, place before you transferred right. then, didn't it? I mean, a lot of experience. Yeah, I, I, just, I don't know. I was stuck between I stuck between two roads. I didn't know what career I wanted. Mm. I didn't know if it was going to be fitness. Did you? Because it sounds like from what I'm hearing, you've got, you've obviously you look up to your dad massively, and you've got a lot of respect for your dad. Did, was there ever a part of you where you thought I actually want to follow his footsteps, maybe become the sergeant major, become the RSM of this family unit, as you called it? Is that something that was a lot on your mind? Is that why it took so long, maybe, to transfer over to? Because a lot of people normally do PTI course, get that hunger for it, and then a few years later they will then do it. Don't normally wait eight, nine years. I would have thought. I don't, maybe, maybe an inch, but I don't, no, I don't think so, mate. Okay. Because I joined the regiment and straight away PTI course, mm. like really soon. So my dad never did that. My dad was, my dad was anything about a tank, gunnery. <laughs> he was through and through, like knew everything. What we call inch, green, a, very green. <laughs> yeah, a school's instructor, uh, everything, like proper, proper, proper good at what he did. And I... I didn't, my dad left a legacy in that regiment. I wanted to leave right. my own legacy yeah, and I sense. wanted to be the very best at the time. I wanted to be the very best PTI in, in the unit. I wanted to be, that. that's that's all, like I, we were doing, I was doing online coaching with people just based on my experience with bodybuilding what, on Excel spreadsheets and Word documents before it became a sexy thing. So like helping people even back then, guys used to come and train with me. And we used to have a little community of people that used to train because there were people there that knew what they did. And I was in good shape, you know. I looked, I looked pretty good. Yeah, we've seen some old pictures of you. Was, very, um, very good shape. <laughs> yeah, I've got some old pictures of me where I was a body, like a bodybuilder, like sitting in at about ninety kilos. I was, I was quite well, I was well rounded. I had a relatively balanced physique, but yeah, I just for, so starting that process for me, yeah, maybe there was an inch of, and uh, maybe a little bit of not wanting to leave the regiment because mm. they meant so much to me. Mm. But at the end of the day, I, I, I wanted to leave my own legacy. Like uh, yeah. I, I do believe in it a little bit, but I wanted to leave my own standpoint. And that's why I sat back on the fence when I got my first post into a training regiment, working with recruits. And, and that was the stage where it's like, now's the time. Now's the time to do what I've always dreamt of doing. I've put it off for such a long time because I wanted to experience as much as I could. I did Iraq. I did Afghanistan yeah. with the unit. I did countless number of adventure training, Canada's like so. I experienced everything it was about that battalion and that unit, yeah. that regiment, and and that was I loved it. I loved that, and I never left the regiment on a sour grape. I left the regiment wanting to just be a be, be better yeah. and do something different. So that was that was everything to me. I mean, one pretty cool thing is you actually deployed with your dad, didn't you? Yeah. So in two thousand and eight we deployed to iraq um, yeah. I was with my dad i was part of his the best way to describe it is our, we were like the force protection for the hierarchy yes. that were look that were teaching the iraqi forces about security about policy about all this change um, and i was my dad's kind of like one of my dad's force protection group um, and they did like an article on us and do you know what that was an experience i'll never forget I, there's not many people that can yeah. say they're deployed with their dad and he never treated me any differently. My dad was a stern fucker with me. Like, <laughs> I, it, I, I didn't want to see him, mate, because I, I used to have to brace up to him and I didn't like it. I had to man remove myself from the environment. If you saw him coming over, blokes used to not tell me and my dad used to stand over my shoulder and go, Oi! Oi, Amund! Stand to attention when I'm stood here! And I'm like, sorry, dad. Sorry, sir. <laughs> oh, so, you know it, what yeah. I mean? So it yeah. was... 
I, 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 const- I tried to remove myself from that environment. So having the yeah. opportunity to work with him in Iraq, I saw a different side to him. I saw a side to him where I watched him teach and deliver. And I was like, this is un- truly remarkable, remarkable yeah. man. And I watched him teach and deliver to the Iraqi forces. I watched how he was around other people. And I wanted to, I wanted to be that person. So that's what I have become today. I've become a, I've become a streamline of what my dad was, but in my own way. And I think everybody's like that, aren't they? But working with him in yeah. Iraq was an incredible experience. And yeah, it was, it was challenging. It was, cha- it was the same time. So my dad, my dad left Iraq early because my mum had got, she's no longer with us, t- bless her, you know, up in the yeah. side now, but she had got breast cancer in, in 2008. It was her second time she had got it. So my dad had to go back home and I was left out there for the last couple of months where we were essentially part of the group that were ripping everything from Iraq back to Kuwait. We were the force protection for the, the ridiculous line of vehicles that was going back from Iraq to Kuwait. Um, mm. And that was a challenge, mate. That was a real challenge because somebody who was my safety net wasn't there anymore. But yeah. I had, I had, and it, it's really weird on tour, really weird on tour. Cause when you're in that environment in an operational setting where you've got your dad, imagine what my mum must've been going through. I, I, I don't even know yeah. how I put that on her, but when, when at moments when I needed to have my dad to speak to, he was there. So, and this is why I think I'm in such a strong mental state because I had that, I had that yeah. access to me and it never, it never, I never suffered or it never bothered me. So having him there to talk to me. So when he left, I was, I, I didn't have that outlet. I had the, I had the boys, like we were a good solid group, but there was just that next level. Do you know what I mean? Where sometimes maybe yeah, you wouldn't course. share what you'd share, but with my old man, he just knew me. He read me like a book. He was like, boy, let's go and have a cup of tea. And I'd be like, yeah, let's do it. And then we're going to have a fag. And then, you know, we'd have a fag and a cup of tea and we'd be talking and he'd be like, look, don't bottle it up. You need to talk, you know, all this. Like, so it wasn't, he was always asking me if I was right. Always a loving father. So I had a great role model, great role model. Mm. Uh, mm. So Dave, if we fast forward a bit to, obviously you're now, you're now in the, yeah, that's obviously the RAPTC, Royal Army Physical Training Corps. So yeah. was your dad still in when you transferred over or did he, was he left at that? So my dad left, oh my God, no, I don't. I think my dad left whilst I was, I think he left in 20, I'm going to say 2014, okay. 2015. So when I had started my transfer process mm. to the core, yes, okay. it was. He, he, and I remember him saying something to me when I was going for my transfer process. And he said to me, you need to do what's right for you. Cause I constantly asked him, I was like, what do I need to do? And he, do you know what? He never forced his opinion on me. He was like, you need to do what's right for you. What do you truly, truly believe is your path? What's your goal? What's your journey? What do you want What do you see yourself doing for the rest of your life? So that week I got, it sounds really fucking cheesy, but whatever. So that week I got hold of a cat badge from, um, for the PT call, cross swords and crown. So I got hold of a cat badge and I stuck that on like a visions board that I had. Um, and that became the goal. The goal at Harrogate was to transfer over to the PT Corps and be the very best, but I didn't want to do that without experience in Harrogate. So I put it at, put it off to the last opportune moment. Um, so I could experience what it was like at a training regiment as an 18 instructor and as in a mainstream PTI. Um, I'd like to think I was a bit different. I'd like to think I was a different coach. I looked at things a little bit differently to other people. Um, I love the AT environment to a degree. I hate it. I hate it now, but I loved it at the time mm-hmm. to a degree because I was able to really coach people, six people at a time, young, young recruits that 16 years old, didn't have a fucking Scooby, but I was able to influence them and really make a change in how, and we had, we had some crazy conversations and that became my pin board. That became, that became my vision to join the PT Corps. And I think every single day the reason i left i left it till last minute because i wanted to explore it but all equally there was no other option for me i was not gonna there was no other option i did not want to move my family back to germany mm. um and i did not want to become as as much as i love it but i didn't want to become a troop sergeant i didn't want to then become a 
a CQMS or a schools instructor and then become a warrant officer within the regiment. I just did, I just as much as I love the regiment, that just didn't tickle my butt. It didn't tickle my fancy. It didn't hit my hit the hit the numbers for me. But what did was it, it, embedding strength and conditioning even more, becoming an even better coach and living the passion that I had had all the way from a young boy watching my dad playing squash, watching elite football players, watching my friends, watching athletes time and time again, watching bodybuilders and being a trainer at that time all the way through those years. And then obviously you adapt and evolve as a trainer. So all those years of, of progression, I was like, now's the time to do it. So I did it once. Um, I set a goal uh, to go on selection in September 20, 2015, I yeah. think it was, um, which was the, towards the end of my posting time at Harrogate. I had like a bit longer to go, but September 15, set the goal. Um, and that was when I was going to go. So did all the prep work for that. Um, spent a year, spent a year preparing. Uh, and that was a year of revising every night i remember reading i remember reading the essentials of strength and conditioning i remember watching hours and hours of gymnastic tutorials on handstands i remember and i i lit i used to pause the frame and take i used to pause the frame and then send it because you could do this now couldn't you send it to email print it off and have like each of the body positions that i needed to hit for the gymnastics in a book and i used to look at them and memorize how I should look and how it should feel when I did the handstand forward roll, jump half turn, backwards roll. To that detail. I remembered, I, I visualized all of the instructions or all of the questions that were asked in the question set for the interview. But what I didn't do is I didn't, I, I tried to like make bullet points of all the answer. I remember that I've still got the crib cards, like literally hundreds and hundreds of crib cards to remind and revise myself, all color coded, meticulous in their detail. And there was blue ones, yellow ones, green ones, red ones, and each one related to the certain element of selection that it was. So we had the interview, we had the verbal brief, we had the gym, handstand forward roll, gymnastic stuff. We had, um, uh, what was it? What else did we have? We had the English literature, English literature exam, we had another exam, key skills, some other stuff. So all of it was linked to something. And I remember writing down all the bullet points that I needed for each specific phase. And the interview was, it was, there was just no stone unturned. The folder that I had, I had taken some bits from other people and just made this thing my own. Mm. And it became like the best book of me, of what I wanted to achieve. Bible, what it sounds like. And <laughs> it was, yeah, it was just... It, it had tabs in it, it had flags in it. Like even my books now on my desk, like I can show you my essentials has got little tacks and tabs. Oh, yeah. I don't even see all the tacks <coughs> and tacks. Like I do it to this day as well. It's, I've still got them going. <laughs> I remember just, it just, yeah. And it just like failing wasn't an yeah. option. Getting selected was the only outcome. And because it meant that me and my wife and my kids could get down south, we could get back in, we could, we could be around like the old shot Guildford Farnborough area. I'd been born in Farm, Farnborough in Frimley Green. Mm. So it meant getting back down to this location, uh, getting, getting to here. Yeah. I wasn't failing. I did not allow myself to fail. And that to some people might sound really arrogant, but to me, I you did, did pass right then. You, you didn't fail, did you? You did pass. pass yeah, as I say, that's where you go, I failed the first time. But I did it around the second time. <laughs> Yeah, and I did really well. Yeah. Did really well. Sounds like it's all that prep. Um, fucking, I'd be surprised it, if you didn't. Yeah, it, like I, I did, but the preparation is 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 the key. Of course, the yeah. preparation, but that that was just a chapter in my journey. That wasn't the goal. The goal then evolved, and I then looked beyond that. It was, it was, it, you know, being selected was probably up there with one of the top five experiences I've ever had in my life. Mm. The feeling afterwards. What's number one, Dan? Your, uh, unless... your first appearance in the podcast, is it? Is that... Ooh, <laughs> that's not there. So that's that made the list, is it? 100%. Yeah. 100%. But there's so much self-induced pressure yeah. when you do selection. No, I bet. PT yeah. course selection. Sorry. PT course selection. Let's refer to it as it. It's PT course selection. Mm. There's so much self-induced pressure when you go through the process. Um, and it is a physically taxing week. You know, the two-day, they don't do it anymore, but they used to do a two-day endurance event which was the old OFT six, which was basically 12 miles carrying 30 kilos at three and a half hours day one. 
And then day two was another 12 miles carrying 25 kilos at two and a half hours. So like it, it was so much self-induced pressure. Like, and it, I, I even fucked that up. I'm not afraid to admit I fucked it up. I wore new boots. I put, I didn't take my feet up properly. I was in shit state. Mm. I'd smashed my knee on the, um, on some of the RMTs that we had done casualty drag. Yeah. Somebody picked me up and their rifle smashed into my knee. It, I was limping for two days. I was, I was in floods of tears because I had so much self-induced pressure on me. Well, you said, my dad, I was you like, didn't want to fail. I mean, you said failure wasn't an option. When failure's not an option. Failure yes, wasn't yeah. an option, mate. And I was in fucking tears. I was yeah. in, I remember being in the room to my wife and I was like, it's, I've end, I fucked it. I fucked it. I've literally ruined everything. And it wasn't until I spoke to my dad and he was like, no, mate, you haven't fucked it. Have they told you you're off the course? No, they haven't. Have they t take it day by day by day by day? And that's exactly the, 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 the information I give to people now. And I was really lucky. Um, one of the selecting officers kind of was like, are you all right? And I was like, yeah, I, I think so. I think I'm good. And I put so much mental pressure on myself to pass that. Yeah, it, it, it meant everything. It yeah. really did. It really, really did. Yeah, and obviously you're now in the uh, you're now in the PT Corps. How, yeah. how, how long have you been in the PT Corps now? So what would that be? That so, been yeah. six years now, hasn't it? So I select was selected our uh, first attempt, first time through September 2015. Started course in. God, I think we moved down here in March. Me and my wife in March okay. of 16. Course started then. Um, badged in past selection and badged in in 2016 December. Okay. Had an um, amazing Christmas. Really, really. In fact, no, I didn't. I lie. Oh, I God. fucking lie. Halfway through the course, the trigger warning for anybody listening, but halfway through the course, this is, there were so many roadblocks, mate. And I just want people to take a message here. My mum died on mm. the 16th of July, 2016. Smack bang in the center of my probationers course on my intermediate term, which is the busiest term on the course. It's where your appointments are set. It's where your physical bet, your physical tests are. There's lots of other elements, management stuff. There's so many different, it's firing at you for 10 weeks. It's constant input. And my mum died. God rest her soul. And I took it hard. I did take it hard. But the day after it happened, or the couple of days after it happened, I needed to be the person that my brother, my dad was in. I, I this This man, think about the man that I've been telling you about. This man was not the man that I knew. This man was a man that was broken. Everything in his life had come crashing down. Everything that 35 years with this woman, everything, the, the woman that was everything to him, everything to him was no longer. And she had suffered a, she'd suffered a really bad heart attack with the medication she was on. She was going through breast cancer. So she was, it was a completely unexpected death. With, with, with death, you can kind of, you can kind of, it, when you think it's going to happen, you can come to terms with it gradually. So my mum just had breast cancer. She was going through remission again. And it triggered me for everything. The guys I'd lost, friends from tour, the people that I'd been surrounded by, the one, it, it triggered everything for me. And I never, ever say, when I go back to telling you I, meant, I feel mentally strong, I do feel mentally strong. And that's why I'm able to talk about it. Because... My mum was like, my mum was like everything to me. So when I went on a week after she had passed away, I went back onto course. Within five days, I was back on course. Two days, I was on the phone to my probationers course instructor on the journey down from here to where my mum and dad lived in Stowmarket on the day that my mum passed away, telling my instructor, I'll send you all of the information I've got over from my IPs because another guy was going to deliver to them he was we, we, were, we had a major generals we were going to do a major generals garden party it's like a potted sports game for the major general for an evening barbecue so there were loads of dignitaries going and i was the guy that was taking the ip really in for in really formal event so i said to I'll, I'll send everything over um i had an aft that i was taking an ip for i'll send it all over i've done the lesson plan let me finish it off i'll send it all over to you that was the type of person i was and he was just like look i don't want to hear from you for the next week go and be with your family don't respond to anything just go and do what you need to do and i remember phoning and i'll say his name because he means a lot to me i remember phoning nick santa nicholas santangeli and i said to him bro i'm so sorry that and he was like mate what are you apologizing for man listen bro we love you do what you need to do we're here for you um and i sped up there 
my wife and kids came back down and the guys dropped off some flowers and stuff to my wife. And she told me and I fucking broke down, man. Like, I was like, I get, I get choked up now fucking thinking about it. And I'm a mentally strong person. It was difficult to deal with, man. Like, really difficult to deal with. Five days after she had passed away, I had, I'd phoned up my instructor, phoned up the boys. I was like, I'm going to come back to work. I'm going to come back on course. So I walked back through the gate, went back into the changing room and I sat down in the changing room with the blokes. And it, it, for me, being around a community of blokes that for something that meant so much to me, and this is maybe why people will bit, maybe understand me a bit more now. Yeah. Like, I'm so passionate and so, so I'm such an in your face type of person. I, I, I agree that brevity is key, but the reason I love being the person I am is because everything, this means so much to me more than anybody else would ever understand. To have your mum die in, and the mum, your mum die in the middle of your fucking probationist course is a tough pill to swallow. To then come back after five days and go through it, I will quite happily tell people hand on heart that I'm a fucking strong bastard. I am a mentally strong, physically strong character and I will do everything in my power to provide for my wife and two kids that mean everything to me. So I went back in and I just wanted to show, I wanted to do, I wanted to do my mum and dad proud, but I wanted to do my mum proud more than anything. So the course finished in December 16. And I remember on the passing off parade, um, they do this ceremony where you go out and get a badge and they stamp it on your chest and they called my name. I walked out, I caught out of the corner of my eye, the whole row of my family that was there, my auntie, my uncle, my dad, my brother, my nan, it, there was just loads of people there. My wife as well, my kids and my dad in the corner of my eye, I caught him and he was in fucking floods of tears, floods of tears. And I'd walked round, slammed my foot back in, stood to attention and I stood at attention for like, maybe 10, 15 seconds. I was like, Whew. and I caught him and that was me. I was gone. Mm. So I stood there at ease, tears streaming down my face and maybe to, and this is a little fucking word of advice for people. Never judge a book by its cover because you don't know, you don't know the detail. You don't know what people have been through and that's why I'll never judge anybody by their cover. I'll always take people as face value and then get to know them. And at that moment, there was probably 150 people in the audience, maybe more, maybe in fact, probably a lot more, Bill. You've done the pass-off parade, plus yeah. all the people that are around me, seeing the newly badged core guy crying, thinking, fuck me, what, what's this guy doing? But I challenge you to listen to that story and yeah. then maybe you'll understand why it meant so much to me. Understand, yeah. Why it meant so much to me. To, exactly. And this is why the journey is everything because everything I'd worked towards, I've got such a special bond with the people that were on my course, um, certain individuals, because they were there for me when, when the person I normally go to, my mum wasn't, and they became everything to me. Um, it, it just, this is why the PT core, this is why everything that I do ha comes with so much passion and vigor. Mm. Because every single day I'm reminded of my mum. I've got a signet ring, with her ashes embedded into a diamond and that sits on my desk. And every morning I wake up, I see that. And every morning I reminded of the stoic mindset that I have, that my mum was everything. My mum was everything about that. So this journey about the person I am today, the coach I am, the athlete I want to be, the, the journey that I'm, been in, that I'm going on as a coach continuously, developing people, selfless. Selfless is a word that people describe me, but I don't describe myself as selfless. I just, somebody, I just give a shit. That's it. I give a shit about other people. And this is where this phrase Mudita resonates so much with me. And I'm so, I guess I might be philosophical, but I'm equally science-based. I'm equally practical. I'm equally empathetic. I'm equally caring. I'm, I just, and this is why I, I was always, do you know what? I, I've always, been worried about jumping forward but ever since that day in july things changed like things have changed massively for me and in the past mm. seven years i've become a person that you would have not have known 
go back 20 years to the times when I was smoking weed and doing God knows whatever other shit in a fucking, in the woods or in a bus stop, wherever else. Like Definitely check Dean out. Yeah. He knows his kung fu. He knows yeah. his kung fu. And I've learned a new word, mudita. Mudita. And a pint of lager. It almost feels like I've always got to say something to go with it now. Have to. You know, mudita, yeah. and a, mudita and a pork, set of pork scratch. I've got to try and shoot on that yeah. word into the title yeah. now, even though people go read it and go, uh, what the fuck is this episode about? Mudita, what's mudita that? Mudita <laughs> and two Peshwari naans, please. <laughs> 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 two Peshwari naans. Oh, that sounds so bad. <laughs>